The Alephasis is first mentioned in the third chapter, technically. Technically, it's the second chapter, but Catelyn 1 of A Game of Thrones. So you got the prologue, you have Bran 1, then you have Catelyn 1. Right. That's the first mention of it. Specifically, there is a descriptive sentence in there when she first mentions the Isle of Faces, and she also mentions the green men and their silent watch. Yes. So I'm scouring this this little paragraph here looking for the adjectives, yeah. the, the descriptors, you know. Sure. And the only one that really stands out is the word silent. Because used, uh, otherwise, yeah, uh, otherwise, a lot of different. Ag- you could have, you could have right said there. the green men and their watch. You could have green men and their stoic watch. S- their anything. I mean, yeah. anything or nothing at all. But that's the only adjective there to describe the green men and their 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 watch. Mm-hmm. So I started thinking, what are they watching over? They're watching over a grove of trees. I mean, there was a, a pack signed. We know that from history. Right. The agreement was to chop down and burn out no more trees. Exactly. And all that kind of stuff. And you could say, well, they were guarding from the Andals, because I thought about the Andals. They came later, but they didn't know they were coming. And then, of course, they did come. They did try to do the same thing, but they eventually settled in into society, and they never touched the Isle of Faces. So what are they guarding, and why are they guarding the place where the pact you know, was signed? As far as the pact goes for... You know, those of you who probably already know, it it's, uh, says the pack was forged there. No more weirwoods were to be put to the axe anywhere in the realm. Exactly. Are the like you said, are they literally standing there silently worried about axes coming across exactly. the water? Exactly. It's right. I mean, what are they actually guarding against? And we know, again, as we mentioned in, in previous um videos that we have only two people in this entire story that we know that have visited the Isle of Faces. And that is Helen Reed, of mm-hmm. course a big character. Huge. Uh, linked to RLJ and everything else. And Adam Valerion during the Dance of the Dragons. Now they both went on to do pretty intense things as far as the story goes. Helen Reed kind of got Lyanna involved with Rhaegar in a sense with the Night of the Laughing Tree. Mm-hmm. He studied with them, whatever that means. Adam Valerion went on to help do a, a decisive battle in the Dance of the Dragons to, to beat uh, the, the Greens. So, pretty pretty important stuff. Right. And then, so it's kind of mentioned a few times, and it's more than just world building. It's mentioned in, in a few places, and then it kind of glossed over. So anyway, to get into a few things, just to kind of throw out, I think, the importance of the God's Eye and why we think um, this is specifically the place. In Danny's first chapter, you have... Uh, this is what I mean, this is all me. a Game of Thrones. This is what gets me, guys. This is all a Game of Thrones. You have Danny's first chapter, and she's remembering things that Viserys has told her about Westeros. She's never seen Westeros whatsoever. And he throws out specific locations, she does, in her thoughts about places that were just words to her that yeah, she has never she seen. Just heard of. Uh, and she mentions places like Castle Rock, the Erie, High Garden, and specifically the Isle of Faces. She mentions the Isle of Faces. So that's there. You know, right. you, she could, I mean, it could easily have been Castle Rock, High Garden, King's Landing, yes. and Winterfell, or There's the a North, million. or a million places, but that was specifically in there. And to back that up, in John's fifth chapter, after joining the Night's Watch, before he takes his vows, he's thinking about, eh, should I really do this or not? Yeah. Second thoughts, you know, cold really, feet. Yeah, really getting the idea of like what this place is going to be like, and Tyrion was right, and all this kind of stuff. He's riding out of Castle Black, trying, thinking about going home yeah. before he becomes a, a traitor or a, a deserter. And he thinks, okay, Winterfell's down this way and all these other places that I'll never get to see. And, of course, he names off Castle Rock, the Red Mountains of Dorne, and, of course, the Isle of Faces. That's just too weird to me. So I mean, this, like, you keep seeing, yes. Now you could say, well, Castle Rock was mentioned twice. But Castle Rock is mentioned throughout the whole book. Yes. The Isle of Faces is in there in two major characters right off the bat, and it's mentioned again. And, and that's, that's three major characters' chapters right there that is already mentioned early on in this book. I mean, very early on. That's mm-hmm. early, early. Uh, and exactly what you just mentioned, Bran 7. Right. Uh, his seventh chapter, uh, early on in Game of Thrones, that's where he mentions the Order of the Green Men for the first time. So, going back to the thing that tr- trying to link, uh, or at least find some little hint as to kind of link the White Walkers or others um, with the Isle of Faces, yeah. the word silence what stood out. It's the descriptive word, like <clears throat> you mentioned. It's the only thing in there you can really look at and say, okay, they describe the Green Men or the Isle this way. Mm-hmm. So how can we look and see, like, for example, the others of the White Walkers, 
are they described in a similar way? Yes, there are similarities. I'll just say the one, one thing that I found, and I'll let you play off of that. All right, you've mentioned the silent. Okay, they're yes. both silent. Both right? silent. In A Storm of Swords, uh, Brand 2, uh, he says, no one visits the Isle of Faces. That's where the green men live. Right. All the tales agreed the green men had strange magic powers. Well, we know they have strange magic powers, too. Right, and Bran would eventually acquire those. Silent, strange powers, take it from there. Exactly. So the, the, the point is there's a, lot of, there's a lot of places in these books where this is thrown around. It's not overdone. Mm -hmm. It's just there kind of under the surface. A Storm of Swords and Bran, too, you really get a lot of that because that's when they're heading up towards the wall with Mira and Jojen. Yeah. And they're telling these stories. Mira specifically is telling these stories to Bran. She thinks she, he, he should have heard these stories from his father. And she's talking about his father visiting the Isle of Faces. So it's mentioned many, many times there. Linking the idea of the, the green men or the Isle of Faces, which are essentially interchangeable for the context here. Or, you right. know, the idea they're, they're there guarding something for whatever reason. And then linking them with the with the others or the White Walkers to see if they're if that because to me is if I was I'm just trying to put myself as in a writer's shoes. Mm -hmm. If I was to go back and rewrite write that prologue later, which after the book was started, and I realized okay, here's what's going to happen. Have an outline. I need to add this, 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 and I need to kind of sprinkle hints. You know, you know this happens. So let's go to the prologue. Right, right there in the opening. Let's go to the prologue. So. The only word, as we said the first time the Isle of Faces is mentioned, is silent as far as the green men. So I went back to the prologue and searched for silent. Now, it is a common term, but it didn't have to be that way. He could have used other terms. He could have used, uh, they could have been completely different as far as the way they moved and mm -hmm. everything. But here's a little list of things in the prologue that describes the White Walkers as silent. The first time we hear the word silent is about will. Right. Will is described as silent, and that's why the Night's Watch likes him, because he can move well. He's a great ranger. Yes. The, the quote actually is, No one can move through the woods as silent as Will, and it had not taken the Black Brothers long to discover his talent. So there's your first silent right there. Now, that's fine, but Will could have just been quick. Right. Or, or nimble or anything, but right. he chose had a keen eye or, you know, something, he, something. Yeah. He was silent. Um, that would come into play, come in handy later, of course, when he cl climbed the damn tree. Damn right it did. Uh, in the same exact chapter or prologue, Garrod. Uh, Garrod's obviously the other night's watch guy with Waymar Royce. And Garrod, his quote goes like this. Garrod glared at the lordling. The scars around his ear holes flushed red with anger where Maester Aemon had cut his ears away. We'll see how warm you can dress when the winter comes. He pulled up his hood and hunched over his garin, silent and sullen. Okay? Silent and sullen. I mean, it could have just been sullen. Yeah. I sure. mean, it could have been just pissed off or angry. Some sim, you know, simple descriptive word, mm -hmm. but silent and sullen. We're not taking every time he says silent as that sentence and that context being important, we're saying he could have used other words. Right, exactly. And then, of course, you have in, this, in the prologue, you have the others when they actually attack. The first time you hear of them, and again, this is literally the first chapter in the whole entire story. So we have our first actual direct reference to the others, and it says this. The other slid forward on silent feet. In its hand was a longsword like none that Will had ever seen. No human metal had gone into forging of that blade. So right there, on Silent Feast, the first direct reference to the others, or the White Walkers, using the word silent. And the first direct reference to the green men. Use the word silent. The very first one for each. Exactly. Use the word silent. Mm -hmm. Another direct reference, now this of course is after the White Walkers have shown up and wheels in the tree and all that good stuff. It says specifically this, again referring directly to the others. They emerge silently from the shadows, twins to the first, three of them, four, five. Sir Waymore may have felt the cold that came with him, but he never saw them, never heard them. So yet another reference to silence. I mean, they could have been loud and obnoxious because Absolutely. they're powerful. So, but he Screaming, chose come just he, roaring. Here. Right, he chose this kind of ninja method, right, of coming in or whatever. And last but not least, in the same exact prologue, we also have another little quote here during the same you know dance. Uh, so, to, so to speak, of, of swords right. with, uh, with the White Walker, we have behind him, to the right, to the left, all around him, 
The watcher stood patient, faceless, silent, the shifting patterns of the delicate armor making them all but invisible in the wood, yet they made no move to interfere. Four to five, I think it's four to five references to the White Walkers themselves, and every single paragraph or or sentence that describes them in some way uses that word silent. Exactly. To be fair, I'm not looking for any other things because this is the theory I'm trying to kind of support, but that's, again, that's the only word you can look for because as far as the green men and the way they're described the very first time they're actually described. And I believe that when the new books come out and the green men are described more, that word will pop up again and again. Right. So I believe, I think, you know, and take it for what it's worth, I think that gives us more of an indication as to where they're going as far as the end game of our story. I I think that helps solidify it for me a little bit as far as the end game. Mm -hmm. But what about the why? What about the why? So let's get into the why and what I I think is is actually going to happen now at the God's Eye and why they're going there in the first place. Are they going there to to just kill the children like we talked about, meet their maker, that type of thing? Yeah, we talked about that in part four. All right, so we've, we've talked about how, you know, these weirwood trees are special yes. as far as what you termed, and I don't know who coined it, weirwood.net. Yes. All right? Absolutely. You know, it seems like when we've discussed, does Bran need to be near one uh, to have his visions? And I'm, I'm of the thought that it's, it's an interconnected, almost nervous system or however you want to whatever analogy you want to come uh, up right. with they're I, I believe so too Absolutely. and if there is a huge grove of them on this island and they all have faces that you know there are some outer spots of trees that have faces that do I believe connect to that I in, in some so. way shape or form whether that's a root system because in the book right. there are a lot of caves and underground systems described or, so that gets down to the point of the importance of the God's eye, right? The, the and why, of it, exactly. why is it important? So if you hear, you, we, as I mentioned earlier, there is a, a little grove of weirwoods north of the wall where John and Sam go take their vows. And it's described as being essentially unheard of because usually they're found in groups of three or four, something like right. that. But there's nine there where they go in the books. Obviously, the, the show is just one tree, a little different. Yeah. But in, in and they're facing inward. The faces are all facing. So you, you take that as a place of you, you get this circular type imagery again, this symbolism of, of this circle, and the faces are all inward in the books. So they're all looking in. So this is a, a place unlike any other in the north. So in the south, you have this huge grove that's being guarded for whatever reason. Right. And to me, I started thinking about what makes it important other than just a vast number of trees. So I go back to the very beginning of the book, and you have Catelyn one again, or Ned's chapter as well, right. where Ned's sitting outside and being informed of John Aaron's death. When he's cleaning his sword, cleaning his sword, all that good stuff, and you hear Catelyn kind of describing her POV from being in the North for a while, because she's kind of a Southern lady from the, the Riverlands. Right. So you know the the Seb, faith of the Seven, and she specifically talks about the Northern gods. Yes. And she calls it a heart tree. And that is actually in, in quotes in the book. So it's called a heart tree. So I never really put much thought in that before because it just, to me, it points out, okay, it's the central point of this location. So exactly. you have a God's wood, which is the tree area, you know, the wooded area. Mm-hmm. And in the center, you have a heart tree. Right. But then I started thinking about with the God's eye idea. Expand that whole you, you, yeah, idea. Take the idea of a heart tree not just being the center of, of the of the actual location, but what it the word heart itself is actually the organ, in a sense, if you use that analogy, yes. that makes everything work. Right. Or you could say the brain for that matter. But you know, the hearts also can be interchangeable with, with mind. You know, it's in our hearts. We, yes. I, I love you with all my heart. You know, right. that type of thing. So it makes me think that the importance of the God's eye is... <laughs> it makes me think that the importance of the God's eye is, is if you take that out, the, the rest of the body no longer functions. As you were saying with it's... the connection, the link there. It's the heart. So it's the heart tree for a reason, not just, I mean, almost literally in the sense of it makes everything else work in the the land. Right. So I think the God's eye is 
the heart. brain of this wherewood.net, the, the central nervous system. Yeah, yeah. The, the like heart. You, like like you said uh, when we were discussing this, like the CPU, if you wanted to use the, that analogy. The CPU, exactly. So, if you have a CPU, a heart, and you want to go by the idea we talked about in parts one through four about, you know, maybe the Night King wants to, you know, end the curse and kill his makers, whatever. What do you have to do? You got to cut out the heart. Got so I started looking a little bit into the books again and tried to find some references to I love this. cutting down or burning werewoods. So here's what you got. And this is from, again, early on in the Game of Thrones. So we have more quotes for you. We really want to pull out a lot of you know canon book material here to support this. So we have Catelyn 1 again, the same chapter that introduces us to the God's Eye right. and the Isle of Faces and Green Men. You have this quote. In the south, the last werewolves had been cut down or burned out a thousand years ago, except on the Isle of Faces, where the green men kept their silent watch. Up here, it was different. Every castle had its godwood, and every godwood had its heart tree, and every heart tree had its face. So there's her describing the gods, like we talked about a minute ago, and the northern beliefs, and you know how there's a heart tree in the middle of every godswood up north, different gods, different customs, all this good stuff. Yep. So she's given, you know, in the context of her thoughts, her own thoughts or whatever, she's just kind of explaining to the audience, us, the reader. Exactly. It's a different <clears throat> world up here. But if you start adding this up with the following, it starts to kind of fit this little puzzle. So you also have this. Mm. Catelyn won again a Game of Thrones. At the center of the grove, an ancient weirwood brooded over a small pool where the waters were black and cold. The heart tree, Ned called it. Now, again, that's Catelyn won. That is where he actually, that's where it's actually quoted the heart tree for the first time. It's a quote in the book. It's right. actually got quotes around it. Which is, yeah. So that there, that, that was kind of supporting the idea we just talked about being the heart, the central nervous system, the CPU, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And again, if, you, if you're using that logic you, you, to take something out, to end something, to end this magic, by which we know they're magical trees, you take out the heart. A Storm of Swords also has a little hint here from Davos 1, and it reads, At Melisandre's urging, he had dragged the seven from their sept at Dragonstone and burned them before the castle gate, and later he had burned the gods wood at Storm's end as well, even the heart tree, a huge white weirwood with a solemn face. So there you go. That's talking about Stannis being kind of controlled or brainwashed by Melisandre right. as she convinces Stannis that he is Azor Ahai or whatever, so he adds the flaming heart of a lord to his, his sigil, his stag. He burns the seven idols of the, the false gods, and specifically she has him take out the heart tree because other religions are blasphemous to her or whatever. But exactly. it opens the door to burning the heart trees, burning the actual weirwoods. Right. So, so I now, started searching. Yeah. For burning werewoods. And here we go. In the same book of Storm of Swords, we have John 11, and it reads like this. John, Melisandre was so close he could feel the warmth of her breath. Where lore is the only true God, a vow sworn to a tree has no more power than one sworn to your shoes. Open your heart and let the light of the Lord come in. Burn these werewoods and accept Winterfell as a gift of the Lord of Light. She's directly telling John to burn the damn werewoods. Right. But you, you, you mentioned in that quote, burning werewoods and open your heart. You know what I mean? Uh, exa I, I just, right, exactly. She's going to say, open your mind. And this is relating to John again and Melisandre. So Melisandre really comes into this as far as, I think, kind of telling us what needs to happen unknowingly. Sure. So we also have this in from uh, John 3 in A Dance with Dragons as kind of a follow-up. Uh, this is before he obviously dies. Mm -hmm. We have this. You have your gods and she has hers. Leave her be. She won't let our gods be, argued Toad. She calls the seven false gods, my lord. The old gods, too. She made the wildlings burn weirwood branches. You saw. <laughs> so, in A Dance with Dragons, following up A Storm of Swords, the same kind of thing here. John's now Lord Commander. And Melisandre has been having the wildlings burn weirwood branches. Now, that in itself, okay, eh, it's kind of cool. But when you think about also the male chapter in A Dance with Dragons, where she sees Bloodraven and Bran. Yes. And sees them in her visions, right, in the fire, part, in the yeah. flames. and see Because she sees the, the boy with the wolf's head who leans back and howls. 
all that good stuff as well. She automatically aligns them with the enemy, the Lord, the 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 great other. But she is unknowingly telling us that she's telling us John needs to burn werewoods. Right. So, would I extrapolate from all that? I'm thinking you're saying the werewoods on the Isle of Faces need to be burned. That's what I'm saying. Get the heart, kill the, the heart, kill the heart. The magic dies, which is what. He's wanting, I believe. Right. You know, he's got it, this it magic this. curse on him. Exactly. The idea is, we talked about in parts one through four, really in part four, as we kind of summed it up, mm -hmm. was that, you know, he possibly wants to end the curse, meet his maker, all the above for that matter. Sure. So, we, we talked about, and to add on to that, we talked about that we don't think that Dragon Glass is going to work on him. Right. We've said Therefore, Valyrian times. steel, right. and, and the show almost kind of helped with that as well, with the whole walking through the dragon fire thing in season seven. It really did. Not only that, you had in season seven them on an icy lake, and on an island right in the, in middle. the middle. So again, you got this circular symbolism with something in the middle, and all those cave drawings from season seven had all the circles, which I believe was was the god's eye anyway. I said that in a separate video when I kind of broke down what I thought the symbols may have meant. Just right. at least some some basic symbolism. Not that it was too over the top for the show. Mm -hmm. But when you read these things in the book and you in these, these these quotes, you can kind of picture this circular thing with a dot in the middle type thing. And they put that in the show for us to see visually. Sure did. So, yeah, it boils down to, with, the, with, with that evidence, that, okay, John, more than likely John, needs to end that magic... To kill the Night King, he will have to burn the Isle of Faces, maybe with dragon fire. So yeah, I mean, I think that's still bitter in a sense, as far as the bittersweet ending that we're supposed to get, because you're talking about ending a culture for good. The idea is that the Night King can't be killed unless you remove that. Maybe you can't remove it somehow physically. Right. I mean, who's got the power to reach in his chest, or can you cut him open? We don't know if, he, if Valyrian still even cut him. It was, so It was literally put in, though, with magic. With magic. I mean, so maybe you have to, rem if the removing thing is the right idea, there's got to be magic involved maybe. So I'm starting to lean heavily to what you're saying. Right. So the idea is, if the, if you go back to kind of through what we're saying, we're saying that the Isle of Faces is the actual heart of the magic, the northern ice magic, the werewood magic, werewood.net, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's going to have to end in order to end the magic that created the Night King in the first place. Exactly. That's how you have to kill him. Right. You have to burn the werewoods down at the Isle of Faces, essentially cutting out the heart. Yeah. The heart tree. But one uh, one more thing for that I wanted to add was uh, the symbolism thing. Mm -hmm. There's a good quote from Arya. Uh, Arya won A Feast for Crows. And it goes like this. The moon singers led us to this place of refuge where the dragons of Valyria could not find us, Dinyo said. Theirs is the greatest temple. We esteem the father of waters as well, but his house is built anew whenever he takes his bride. The rest of the gods dwell together on an isle in the center of the city. That is where you will find the many-faced god. Wow. So you have another thing where he's talking about gods. This is Arya has got to Bravos. She's looking for the house of black and white, trying to find out what's going on. And you have this symbolism again of you'll find the many-faced God, many faces, many trees. Now, obviously, it's a different context, but if you think exactly. about it, the breadcrumbs in an aisle at the center of the city. This this circular, you know, whatever, and Which, an island in the middle where you'll find the many faces. So anyway, uh, a lot of cool stuff in there, a lot to think about. So we definitely want to know what you think. Is Absolutely. this how this is going to end? Are we I, convincing I'm, you, or at least swaying you to, you know, jump on board? Because, like, yeah, like I yeah. told you, this could be a swing and a miss. Yes. But I think it's going to be a close. I think it'll be a foul tip at, yeah. at worst. <laughs> Share this video and let's get it. Let's get it out there and see uh, see what people think and see if we're we're right, wrong, or indifferent. Let's stir the pot. Exactly. That's stir the pot. Exactly. So anyway, guys, uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you.